Good morning, good morning from New York City. For our viewers around the world, I'm Matt Miller in for Jonathan Farrow. And if he's watching this morning, I will say, John, Merry Christmas to you. We are looking at S&P futures that are unchanged as our NASDAQ futures, a slight gain in the small caps. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. I will kick it off as John does every day with a big issue wrapping up a messy year for markets. The volatility to start the year. It's been a pretty volatile time. We're seeing that volatility play out. We have had 10-year Treasury yields break 4%. This bear market rally in recent months. Inflation is still elevated. The biggest factor this year has been man-made volatility. Whether it's fixed income, equities, commodities, currencies. We have a war, we have Federal Reserve tightening rates. Um, we have all types of things going on in the oil market that are beyond anybody's control. But there's another shoe that has to drop, and that is the economy. We'll start to see some disappointment maybe as we move into 2023. What can go right in 2023? We don't think it's going to be uh, necessarily a year of robustness. There's so much pessimism. This recovery isn't going to be easy. Joining us now is Ironside's Barry Knapp, as well as Ed Perks of Franklin Templeton to talk about the year that was and the year to come. Uh, we got the last data points of the year trickling in with the personal consumption expenditure, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation coming in, in line for the most part with expectations, although the core PCE year over year was 4.7%. We were looking for 4.6%. Nonetheless, it's better than the previous figure of 5%. Uh, Barry, I'll start with you. What do you think about uh, the inflation story for 2022? Does it continue into 23? <clears throat> yeah, I think the, um, the path from nine to four actually looks like nine to three and a half by June is, is very clear. Um, goods inflation, which is the first order effect of the pandemic related inflation is coming down hard. The comparisons are such that those year on year rates are gonna drive the headline number well below the current Fed policy rate. So they will be at sufficiently restrictive. Um, it's, it's quite clear that, that um, housing-related inflation will come down as well. And then to use Chairman Powell's framework that he laid out at the Brookings Institute a couple of weeks ago, services less rent of shelter or non-housing-related services inflation has missed or been much cooler than expected the last couple of months, and that looks like it's coming off as well. The Fed's particularly concerned about wages driving that higher. But when you look at that, it looks more like an accounting identity that he's describing, meaning, yes, yeah, sure, wages are a big component of service sector inflation. But when you actually run the statistics on it, it wages explain something like 18% of the movement in services prices. So it's a little more complex than Chairman Powell's been describing it. And um, I think it's, it's quite clear that inflation is on its way lower. The question is, how low does it go? I think through the first six months of the year when it's falling, that'll be a good period for risky assets, for equities, even for treasuries, which remain overvalued. However, I expect it to stall around mid-year and the Fed to have a bit of a quandary in the second half of the year. You know, do we continue to press as hard from right. four to get it to two as we did to get it from nine down to three and well, a half? Well, let's bring four. Ed in and see uh, what his take is. So Ed, Barry thinks inflation is going to keep falling through the first six months. The second half um, could be a little bit more difficult. What are your expectations, especially considering, you know, one more data point seems to show that inflation is indeed coming down. We peaked in June, um, and now we're looking at a 4.7% year-over-year core PCE. Yeah, I, you know, I really agree with a lot of what Barry just described. I mean, I think the first half really doesn't present a lot of uncertainty for investors. We've 
the Fed's really anticipated what the path is here. Um, yes, you know, we have some interesting data before that March 22nd meeting. Um, but, but at this point, whether or not we peak at a 5% Fed funds or a, or a five and a quarter is, is really, in, in, in the scheme of this last year, pretty irrelevant to, uh, to us. And I think Barry really hits it on, on the nail on the head, really. The, uh, the second half of 23 is where the uncertainty lies. Does it take longer for inflation to get to the level uh, that the Fed's going to be more comfortable with and certainly make any kind of pivot um, uh, to what markets expect, which is kind of cuts as we get closer to the end of, of 23. So that's where the uncertainty lies, and I think that's what the challenge for investors will be. But the good news is uh, uh, most of what's happened in markets, in monetary policy, and in interest rates is behind us. So 2023 will not be 2022, which is good news for investors. Well, we have Bloomberg economist Scott Johnson has forecast global growth of 2.4 percent this uh, coming year, which is bad, right? It's if you take out the crisis years of 2020 and, and uh, 2008, then it's the worst in the last 30 years. Now, if you break that up between the U.S. and Europe uh, and what you see going on in Asia, the U.S. looks a little bit better than Europe, maybe not as good as China post-reopening. Uh, he sees the same kind of thing, Barry. He says the U.S., is going to have a decent year, although the second half is going to be problematic. Why, why is that? What, what's wrong with the second half that we can't fix now in December? Right. Well, the question is, why did we have disinflation for 20 years, and why will we not have disinflation for the next 5 to 10? And, and the answer is, the, when you decompose inflation into its parts during the 2000s and th 2010s, all of the deflationary impulse came from one place. It was core goods prices, and I would attribute that to the massive labor supply shock that took place in China, which was the integration of 750 million workers or so that migrated from mud huts into the cities and put that downward pressure on goods prices. So as we go through a restructuring of supply chains, deglobalization process, it's unlikely we get that disinflationary impulse. Additionally, the, um, the amount of fiscal transfers that are going on right now and likely to persist, even with some tweaks related to this omnibus bill, are much higher than they were pre-pandemic and have been rising for, for years. And so that implies higher services sector inflation than the 3% or so trend we have for the last 20 years. So there's a whole range of things that argue that it's going to be very difficult to get back to two. And that there's a question about whether we should go back to two. I saw Ben Bernanke speak back in October, and he said there's a good argument that two shouldn't really be our target, but now's not the time to have that debate. I almost wonder if at Jackson Hole next year, Mike will undoubtedly what, what be saying, there. He's saying three, maybe a better? Might, it might be. The real point is it should just be stable. We had stable prices in the 90, 90s with a very low standard deviation of inflation, and we had a capital spending boom. In the 60s, we had, again, very stable prices until the end of the decade, and we had a capital spending boom. We just need stability. Whether it's around a 3% mean or a 2%, for me, is almost irrelevant. It can't be around a 5 or a 6, but that's, that's going to be the debate that's going to take place in the second half of the year. And the question is, do they have the will to keep pushing? Um, I would argue probably not. It took 10 years of inflation right. to create the political environment that made Volcker possible. We've had 18 months of it, so I doubt it. Um, Ed, what do you think? And especially as, you know, uh, as chief investment officer at Franklin Templeman, you've got to make, you know, investment decisions. So it affects, obviously, the path of um, rates, the corporates that you're buying. So what, is it, what does it look like to you? Yeah, you know, I, I think we, you know, we've clearly set the trend. And if you look on the month-on-month -month numbers, they are coming down. We are trending towards that point. We can certainly envision getting to mid 2023, um, as Barry mentioned, maybe the Jackson Hole debate is around what level uh, should we be thinking about for the next five to 10 years, and maybe that will look very different than the, the prior 20. But it still doesn't change um, the fact that directionally we're, we're heading in in the right, uh, uh, we're on the right path, and that certainly impacts how we think about uh, about markets. We've obviously we're starting the year in a very different zip code. Um, one and a half percent ten year to start this year. Obviously, we're we're sitting at three seventy today. If you look at corporates, investment grade corporates in particular, much more attractive yield opportunity, a much lower bond price 
uh, uh, dynamic at play in in today's markets than uh, than where we started the year. So you know we certainly are finding a lot more opportunities across fixed income markets, uh, and and the the path that we expect for uh, for rates um, you know really indicates a, a, a somewhat. A benign market to invest in in that area. I think in the equity markets, it's a little bit more difficult. We, um, you know, we do have some challenges. I think with with corporate fundamentals coming up, um, earnings, you know, certainly may get through this period, particularly if economic damage is is, a, is more muted or if it's a, a, a more of a soft landing. Uh, uh, overall impact on the economy, but the reality is uh, generating earnings growth or seeing a market that could uh, that could benefit from multiple expansion really doesn't seem to be uh, all that likely to us. So we're we're going to continue to be relatively cautious with uh, equity markets and favor companies that uh, that potentially can deliver some total return with dividends. And and that'll be a place well, certainly a focus. Well, we're going to talk about that, Ed. Um, you know how big a component yield makes up of total return, how important that is to investors in 2023, and also talk about um, how corporate earnings turn out in 2023. I've been talking with Barry about this a little bit, so I'm excited to get into it. Right now, I want to get back to the economic data, though. The big PCE number that came out, really the last big data point of the year, I think. Let's get over to our uh, economics and politics correspondent, Mike McKee, um, to tell me if I'm right or wrong and walk us through what we saw. You're always right, Matt. That's why you're in the big chair there. Uh, we're looking at, as you were saying at the beginning of the show, what's going to happen in the first part of the year. The Fed has already laid out its path, and we didn't get anything that would deviate from that path today. We saw inflation drop. Uh, the PCE measure, of course, is the Fed's favorite measure of inflation. It's what their 2% target is based on, the headline. And we've dropped now to 5.5% from 6.1%, a fairly major drop. Uh, it's got to continue, but that is progress. And the core uh, up to tenths. Now, uh, the core didn't fall as far on a year-over-year -year basis because October was revised higher, but it is still down. We're getting in the right direction. And here's something that's interesting. The Fed forecast uh, at its last meeting, we're going to get 4.8 percent PCE at the end of the year, core PCE. Uh, right now, we are below that. It would take a major rise in inflation in the month of December. And then we would, uh, to, for us to uh, actually go over what the Fed's thinking. In terms of the economy, watch income and spending both down, uh, which is something that the Fed wants to see durable goods orders down, so uh, as were uh, capital goods orders. So basically, we're seeing the economy slow. We are seeing inflation drop. We are seeing what the Fed wants to see. All right, so we are seeing what the Fed wants to see now, and it would have to go haywire in December to get us um, above uh, the danger zone that they have outlined. Barry, at Ironsides, I know you do channel checks. You're looking at what's going on in this holiday spending season. We saw, I think, consumer spending actually tick down a little bit, although personal income was up. If that happened in my household, my wife would kiss me. Um, <laughs> What are you seeing for, for December? What do you think the end of the year is going to really show us 2022 uh, turned out at? Um, I agree with, with Mike's general char uh, characterization of the economy that growth is slowing. I think a lot of people have been thrown off this year by looking at the GDP numbers. I actually despise them and much prefer <laughs> gross domestic income, right? Because income drives spending both at the household level and at the capex uh, corporate level, those numbers, particularly on a nominal basis, have been steadily declining. I will order, uh, offer a little word of caution about the retail sales number we got and the uh, personal spending numbers. The last couple of years, we've had real distortions in seasonal adjustment factors. So on a nominal ba or unseasonally adjusted basis, those numbers have surged late in the year, and then the seasonals have actually pushed the aggregate, you know, real number or the um, unadjusted or adjusted number, excuse me, down, but then they've bounced hard at the beginning of the year. So I think this is what happens in a, you know, in a, in a recession or big pandemic is these seasonal adjustment factors get um, distort the data of for course. a period of time. That same thing happened after the global financial crisis. So I think overall spending patterns are still pretty okay. All right, we're going to talk about that as well as how much consumers actually have left to spend because savings rates have been going down, but it looks like the stock of dollars, as Mike was telling me uh, a couple hours ago, are still really high. Barry Knapp is going to stick with us from Ironsides, Ed Perks from Franklin Templeton with us as well. Coming up, the Senate passes a $1.7 trillion spending bill.
A lot of hard work, a lot of compromise, but we funded um, the government with an ingress aggressive investment in American families, American workers, American national defense. We'll talk about that potential inflationary impulse next. This is Bloomberg. A lot of hard work, a lot of compromise, but we funded um, the government with an ingress aggressive investment in American families, American workers, American national defense. We believe we have real needs on the defense side now with Ukraine more than ever, but we believe there are just as many and just as important real needs on the um, domestic side. Now, we got a whole lot done here. Chuck Schumer speaking there, the Senate passing a $1.7 trillion spending bill, doubling down on U.S. support for Ukraine with a fresh dose of aid as well. This as Russia considers cutting its oil output by 700,000 barrels a day in response to the G7's price cap on exports. Russia's Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak saying, quote, we'll try to find some common ground with our counterparts. But right now, we'd rather take a risk of a production cut than stick to the policy of selling in line with the threshold. Team coverage starts right now. Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick down in D.C. Abigail Doolittle uh, here with me in New York City. Jack, we'll um, start with you. Give us what we know about this huge omnibus that uh, Barry Knapp was referencing earlier. Yeah, it was, so this is the whole government funding uh, bill plus some other stuff. There's about $47 billion tacked on separately uh, for Ukraine. Um, this was a reflection of how lawmakers debated uh, government funding I I with inflation in mind. Uh, looking at the purchasing power of the military, the, the Republicans pushed hard for roughly a 9 percent increase in defense spending. They tried to hold down the non-defense domestic stuff as much as possible, uh, but that was difficult because Veterans Affairs health funds have, their, their spending rate has, has to, had to increase uh, quite a bit. So you see a, a significant increase in discretionary spending, more as a response to in the inflation numbers that we've seen. Uh, the discretionary spending is the, the minority of all federal spending. Uh, it doesn't include things like Social Security. So it, I haven't heard a ton of um, concern from lawmakers that this is a, something that would trigger more inflation and really that would be responsible for a growing deficit. Uh, but it's, it's something where you get an increase in the defense and non-defense spending and you get enough support on the Republican and Democratic sides so that they were able to get this through the Senate. All right. And Abigail, you know, we talk about um, the Russian the Russians possibly curtailing their oil output. We do see a bit of a bump in oil prices today. We're back up to $80 a barrel in WTI Brent over 82. Yeah, well, you know, it's not so surprising at all because in terms of uh, this response from Russia, it's been long awaited after that price cap put on by the G7 of $60 per barrel. Traders really waiting to see how Russia would respond. One key point is it's not certain that this is going to happen. It's May. Russia may cut its daily output by 500 to 700,000 uh, barrels a day. So the headline optics are very good. Not surprisingly, you have oil popping on it, the spike in energy, the war premium. The bigger picture, though, uh, is the demand uh, destruction that we've seen over over, let's call it the last year, uh, especially with China having been largely locked down. So we really have oil locked in this range. At this point, let's call it between, I think you see oil go back up toward 87 on this war premium, this response from Russia, and uh, the deputy from Russia just talking about it as a, a conversation. It doesn't sound like it's set in stone. And then on the other hand, you have this demand destruction. It wouldn't be surprising after going back up toward 87, maybe down toward 65, the uncertainty here around the fundamentals on oil. All right, Abigail and Jack, thanks very much for joining us on that. Let me get back to our guests here. Um, Barry Knapp uh, from Ironsides with me on set. Uh, Ed Perks also with us from Franklin Templeton. Ed, what do you think about the, um, the oil situation I think is interesting? Not the Russian kind of noise. If we're not going to buy it from them, they just sell it to the uh, Indians or the Chinese, and then we buy the refined products anyway. Um, but the, the, the COVID zero reversal, I think, is fascinating in that it's not really driving um, oil or commodities prices much higher. Yeah, well, I think we're in the early days of seeing exactly what uh, what will play out in the Chinese economy as they move uh, beyond the China, uh, beyond the COVID zero policies. So I think as we think about 23, 
um, you know, an unwind of that or, or the demand weakness or destruction that happened in 2022, we might see the other side of that, particularly in the, the middle to back half of 23, you could see some demand strength. Um, I think you also have to think about uh, things like the strategic petroleum reserve and the drawdown of that um, in in, uh, in 22 is unlikely to uh, uh, to, to um, occur in 23. And in fact, we'll probably see the opposite at some point, the need to uh, restock some of the inventories uh, we have in the U.S. Uh, Barry, what do you think about, you know, I think it's fascinating to follow what's going on there because in China, uh, you know, there's the potential for huge demand. On the other hand, we got a headline across the terminal earlier that they're looking at 37 million right. new COVID cases a day. And that's just what they're telling us, right? So how do you gauge what used to be really the driver of global, of global growth? Yeah, I, I always um, viewed China's impulse to the rest of the world first from a just trying to track it perspective, looking at their ordinary imports. And those have been decidedly weak. So we've seen no pickup. You'd assume that after they get through this COVID wave that you'll have two uh, offsetting inflationary shocks. One will be disinflationary, which will be supply chains clearing further and further downward price pressure on goods prices, but then commodity prices headed back up. I, th I think the uh, energy market is undersupplied. It was one of the things that was missing from the omnibus spending bill was Joe Manchin's deal to get permitting reform wasn't there. So I, I, I like the energy stocks for a, a myriad of reasons. Still in, going into next year. Yes, in part because what shale did was fundamentally change the elasticity of supply. It used to take four years to drill a well in the Gulf of Mexico. If you capped it, it was gone. You can now restart a well in, you know, approximately three weeks. So those companies should have much more stable return on invested capital over time. And um, it's an undersupplied market for, for a myriad of reasons. And I, I think those stocks are going to they're going to be secular outperformers. All right, we're going to continue to talk about the effects of that bill that, that you brought up and that we talked about with Jack Barry Knapp and Ed Perk sticking with us. Coming up, the morning calls. And later, a miserable year for big tech, heading for its biggest annual decline since the financial crisis. More on that at the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the open. I'm Matt Miller in for John Farrow. Time for our morning calls. First up, Loop Capital downgrading Paramount to a sell. The analysts seeing a challenging return to profitability. Next, Argus raising its FedEx price target to $200 a piece, highlighting the stock's attractive valuation. And finally, Wedbush cutting its Tesla price target down to $175. The analysts expecting the automaker to miss production targets. Coming out, the five biggest names in tech shedding nearly $4 trillion in market cap. This is the countdown to the open. I'm Matt Miller in for Jonathan Farrow. Moments away from the start of trading on this, the last trading day before Christmas. We are looking at futures that are doing a whole lot of nothing in terms of uh, S&P futures, now down about three tenths of 1%. NASDAQ futures off half a percent. So they have crept down over the last few minutes. Uh, small caps, a uh, little changed right now. There you hear the opening bell on the New York Stock Exchange. Let's take a look at um, how other asset classes are moving right now at 930 on a Friday morning in a very cold and, well, no, a slightly cold and very rainy New York City. It was dumping it down this morning. Take a look at uh, Tesla. First of all, they're um, one stock that is uh, we're going to focus on in a moment, but the dollar, the euro dollar at 106 right now, and the U.S. 10 year yield a little bit under 370. Tesla trading at 125.98. It's up about two tenths of a percent. I might have expected a bigger pop um, had I not known that Elon Musk has gone back on his word a number of times. He reiterated in a Twitter spaces, which I don't know what that is, but apparently some kind of public interview forum, that he's done selling shares. He's not going to sell shares for another two years after dumping nearly $40 billion of his holding. Take a listen. I'm not selling any stock for, I don't know, I'd call it a minimum 18 to 24 months. 
So you can count on me like most no, no stock sales till probably, I don't know, 25, 2025 or something. But he's promised already twice this year that he wouldn't sell any more stock and he's come back with huge billion dollar sales. So here's Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow in London with an explanation. Ed? Good morning. Producers in the control room, let's bring the shares back up. We're now down six tenths of one percent. Six straight day of declines. The, the higher open was very short lived. Six straight days of declines on this stock. That's the longest streak of declines for Tesla going back to March of 2020. We're trading at the lowest level since September of 2020. Musk said, as you played that soundbite, he will not sell any Tesla shares over the course of the next two years or in the next two years, not this or next year, 2023 at least. You are right, Matt. He said something similar in April and August and then followed by selling big tranches of the stock. He has sold $40 billion of Tesla shares to date, in large part, of course, to finance the equity portion of the package to buy Twitter. What was really interesting, actually, this decline in Tesla shares, if you strip out options, oh, look at the timing on that, terrific. SpaceX is actually now his most valuable holding. It's the biggest individual piece of his net worth, according to Bloomberg Billionaires Index Net Wealth Analysis, which I think is interesting. Musk has been on Twitter a lot, Matt. I mean, you, you were gracious enough to have me on your show earlier. and We were talking to Craig Trudeau about the emphasis Musk has been putting on the macro and also the Fed raising rates and the outlook for rates as being sort of uh, indicating that that's been what's weighing on the shares. But there's also elements that's of key man risk. I think that's right. Well, that, that's what he's saying, at least. And I think Dan Ives of Webbush had a, a, an interesting note out overnight, actually, where he says essentially that right now uh, Tesla needs a leader. It doesn't need a, a Ted pilot. I think you know the, the film I'm referring to and that what Dan Ives is referring to in that. But, you know, I keep looking at my screen because it, it's, it's really interesting, this reaction. We were up, you know, sort of 1% in, in pre-market and, and we very quickly turned negative again. So, again, you know, it, 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 I guess it's a question of how much the market believes that Musk will follow through with what he said. Can I say, first off, Ed, it's our privilege when you join us on uh, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. So we were glad to have you with us. You talked you. a little bit with Craig Trudell. Uh, you and I both talked a little bit with Craig Trudell, Bloomberg's global auto czar, um, about Tesla shares, about Elon Musk this morning. He does, the CEO, blame the Fed. Uh, he has, in a tweet, blamed the Fed for the um, collapse in Tesla shares. Meanwhile, shares of Ford, shares of General Motors, they've climbed. So it begs the question, why does the Fed hurt this EV you know, startup, if you will, and doesn't hurt these yeah. giant gas incumbent players? Yeah, I, I would point out, and I, you know, I'm trying to get the data up on my Bloomberg, but Tesla, when last I checked, is a stock that trades at 33 times forward earnings. Um, it is a stock where analysts on the sell side and investors that hold the stock that I've spoken to, they acknowledge the macro headwinds, right? Particularly around the story in China, where there is a, a want for more information about production because there's been disruption to production. We also want to know about the demand picture because there are indications, for example, the $7,500 incentive as of yesterday on new Tesla vehicles before the end of the year, or price cuts in China. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And, and it's a very good point, uh, Ed. Tesla trading at 30 times forward earnings, GM and Ford trading at five times forward earnings. Ed Ludlow yeah. uh, there who covers well, he covers a lot of stuff for us, tech mostly, but also cars in a sense. So tech stocks getting hammered um, really across the board in 2022. It was a horrible year for big tech. The biggest players shedding $4 trillion in market value, as we were telling you. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle to talk about um, really the, the, the crash of these mega tech stocks, Abigail. Yeah, it's really pretty incredible, Matt. And uh, the crescendo seems to be here in December. Overall, we have that NASDAQ 100 down uh, about 8% heading to its worst month. Well, since September, because it has been a rough year. But the percentages are pretty staggering for the month of December. Apple down 11%, Amazon down 13%, Microsoft down 6.7%, Alphabet down 13%. Any way you slice and dice it, pretty brutal. And there is uh, that 10% decline for the NASDAQ 100. Very interesting, out of the October low, it had actually been up 
15%. So really giving a lot of back about it. And you know, the reason that Tesla has that higher valuation, well, it does have the technology piece. It is down in this month, down 36%. Rivian though, down 80, 38%. Lucid down 32%. So EV overall taking a big hit in December. A piece of this having to do with yields rising, that 10 year yield up about 13 basis points. That of course makes these companies look even more expensive. But to your point on the year, Matt, well, the NASDAQ 100 has now been below its 200 day moving average. Average uh, for much of the year, the longest period since going back to uh, 2008, 2009. So it's been a rough, rough year. One point I would make, though, Matt, we still have that Nasdaq 100 up more than 5% from its October low. So let's see what the new year brings. Absolutely. Abigail Doolittle, thanks very much for that. I want to get back to Barry Knapp from Ironsides and Ed Perks from Franklin, Franklin uh, Templeton to talk about a little bit about valuations. Uh, Barry, you heard Ed talking about Tesla's valuation compared to GM and Ford. Obviously, it's huge. I just looked at the NASDAQ um, trading at, I think, 45 times earnings overall. But if you just look at those that actually make money, it's about 20 times earnings. The S&P um, trading about 18 times earnings. Are valuations, do we need to rethink valuations um, for the end of 2023? I think Elon Musk should thank the Fed and the Treasury, for that matter, for the excessive valuations that were created in 2021 when the Fed was injecting a trillion and a half of liquidity into the market and the Treasury, through aggressive management of their, their account at the Fed, injected 1.7 trillion in two thirds of the time, that drove valuation to levels that still look excessive. I mean, me. without that kind of froth, he would never have been able to pay $44 billion for Twitter. Right. So yeah. if you break the equity market into <clears throat> three components, tech and tech related, um, the defensive sectors and then the economically sensitive cyclical sectors, tech is still rich. It's been getting, valuations have been getting crushed all year, but still expensive. The defensive sectors are now excessively valued because people piled into those as we're going through this broad Fed related correction. And the cyclical stuff all looks cheap. So in a microcosm, that was your Ford GM versus Tesla dynamic. And, um, you know, given my relatively optimistic outlook for nominal growth next year and limited earnings downside as a consequence of that, I think the cyclical sectors are still the place to be. So I think tech has another year on the stock of side. And I think Ed, coming. I mean, Ed, jump in here. What do you think about these companies from a fixed income perspective? Um, you know, are yields high enough now that you want to? Be involved. You already involved there. Are you worried about a wave of defaults? Maybe not for the big cyclical, you know, established cyclical uh, players. Yeah, you know, I, 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 this is a great point, Matt. I think when we look at uh, at the comparison of of investing in the equities of of, of companies, say just broadly in the S and P five hundred, uh, versus the prospects of investing in their longer term debt securities, if we were to go back twelve months. Um, especially for dividend equities. I mean, th those yields compared very favorably to the yield you could get by investing in their bonds. Today, that's a very different situation with investment grade corporates now yielding well into 5%. So uh, what used to be a deficit in yield from bonds relative to stocks is now quite a premium. So in many companies, we've actually uh, seen that uh, dynamic and have ag aggressively repositioned out of equities where valuations still look somewhat um, unattractive uh, and and in favor of debt security. So, you know, as Barry laid out, though, I think those three kind of ways to think about tech, tech related, defensives, and and cyclicals. You know, you generally ag agree with that assessment. Uh, I think for tech, you do need to step back. You really can't look at just this past year and those major declines in the real mega cap technology companies that were listed on the screen uh, uh, shortly ago. Um, if you step back and look where they're trading relative to certainly pre-pandemic levels, it really is an unwind of a lot of that just hyper growth that we experienced from June of 2000 through the end of 2021. All right, Ed, it's been great having you on the program. Ed Perks there from Franklin Templeton, Barry Knapp as well from Ironsides. We've got to get you guys back and preferably together in the same studio, right? Uh, it was really great talking to both of you. I want to get to uh, some of the other stories that must have caught your attention um, as we get closer to the end of the year. Yesterday, for example, Sam Bankman-Fried released on a $250 million bond just 48 hours after touching down in New York City. It's one of the largest pretrial bonds in U.S. history, but fascinatingly, at least to me, it's secured by his parents' house in California, which isn't worth $250 million. 
it's not even worth $25 million. So who knows how these bail bonds work? In any case, Shanali Basic has the details on everything else uh, we want to know. Shanali, what can you tell us about Sam Bankman-Fried and his cohorts um, at the bankrupt FTX. Yeah, if you think about it, Matt, that $250 million bail package, one of the largest in U.S. history, it compares with $250,000 when you look at the bail set for his colleagues who are cooperating with authorities right now. You, that is Caroline Ellis and Gary Wing, who's an FTX founder. And of course, they themselves are facing a number of charges by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Now, back to Sam Bankman-Fried himself, to your point, this $250 million, uh, his parents' house is securing this bond, except for even his parents' house is not even anywhere near that amount. Uh, according to our own Chris Dolmesh, typically, uh, you only need assets worth about 10 percent of the stated amount here. The idea here is for harsh punishment, harsh financial consequences of bail jumping. So really, the idea here is uh, to make Sam bankman fried know that this is serious. Uh, this is a long fight ahead. He is expected to appear in court again in early January, January 3rd. Certainly, this case has quickened very, very meaningfully. Of course, concurrently, mm. we have the bankruptcy proceeding happening for FTX as well, in which they're finding out more details about how the assets have been used. As we know from the SEC and CFTC cases, there's a lot of allegations about signing personal loans to themselves from FTX, uh, backed by the customer money over at FTX to buy things like luxury homes and make political donations. So following the money is going to be what's next. All right, Chanali, thanks very much. Chanali Basic there reporting on FTX. I will say that the New York Post reports that uh, the Bankman Freed home is worth about $4 million. So it's not quite 2% of this giant bail bond that we're talking about. Coming up, a winter warning from a much more expensive house, the White House in Washington, D.C. Please take this storm extremely seriously. And I don't know whether your boss will let you, but if you all have travel plans, leave now. We'll talk travel with Callens, Helena Becker, still ahead. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, PGIM's Michael Collins on Bloomberg's Real Yield. That conversation at 1 p.m. New York, 6 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Please take this storm extremely seriously. And I don't know whether your boss will let you, but if you all have travel plans, leave now. I'm not, not a joke. I'm telling sending my staff, my staff, if they had plans to leave on tomorrow, late tonight or tomorrow, I'm telling them to leave now. Don't leave now. That was a warning from the president yesterday. Leave yesterday is uh, what he was saying. Surging COVID cases weighing on China's economic activity, a huge storm uh, working its way through the U.S. All of this um, maybe a caution to investors in transportation and airline stocks. Um, Maybe you want to watch out whether you're investing here or there. Uh, you're not, you shouldn't maybe be expecting a pickup uh, anywhere around the world. Um, Seth, Secretary Anthony Blinken, uh, in, in terms of China, urging more transparency amid concern that officials there are downplaying the impact of reopening. We've got team coverage uh, of both of these stories right now. Michelle Cortez joins us from Hong Kong alongside Brian Sullivan in Boston. And Michelle, let's start with you on the China story. I saw a headline this morning that China itself says 37 million new COVID cases a day. Is that true? A single day, that is what we are learning from our reporting inside China's top health officials. They're saying that they expected on December 20th that there were 37 million infections on that day alone. So far in the month of December, almost a quarter of a billion infections, 248 million. Of course, the thing to keep in mind is that Testing has fallen off the radar screen entirely in China, so we don't really have great data, but that is the number that they are estimating from the very top in China at this moment. So a massive amount of infections, and I guess the result is, Michelle, that 
a lot of people in China are just staying home. They're not going out and booking trips or they're not taking the trips they have booked. They're not driving around filling up their tanks um, and, and using oil everywhere. They're just going back home even if they're now allowed to leave. Exactly. They have lifted all of the restrictions. Of course, there have been incredibly tight lockdown measures and other types of mo mobility limitations in China throughout the entire three years of the pandemic. Even when just a handful of cases pop up, they shut everything down. But there, that is nothing to what we're seeing now, where people just aren't going out themselves. They're allowed to go out. The stores are theoretically open, but there aren't people to staff those stores. There aren't people to run those trains, and people are staying home either because they're sick their family members are sick or they're desperately trying to not get sick. There is definitely not a lot of action happening right now in China. All right. What an awful situation. Michelle Cortez from Bloomberg News. Thanks very much for that. Brian Sullivan, let's get to you in Boston. We have our own uh, travel issues here, but those are all weather. What does it look like right now? We just heard the president warning last night. So we've got a widespread storm that's going to leave a lot of people um, home alone in the dark without their Christmas gifts. Um, you know, uh, more than 23 states have had power outages. Thousands of flights have been canceled. Ground transportation is tied up both on the roads and the rails. And FedEx said that they can't deliver, um, they can't guarantee deliveries for Christmas. All right. So uh, I'm looking to fly back to Jamaica tomorrow morning, Brian. What are the chances that my flight actually leaves LaGuardia? <laughs> so... You know, you you probably have a good chance, but the uh, thing that might get you is that all the people that have had to rebook their flights and, um, you know, have, they're having traffic problems moving planes around the country, you know, there might not be a plane for you, there might be uh, no room for you. So that's the kind of thing that you might uh, encounter or lots of delays or long lines at the airports for people to go through security. All right, well, let's, let's hope against hope that I make it. Brian Sullivan, thanks very much for that. Brian Sullivan giving us the latest on the weather and there could be delays to your Christmas deliveries. Let's talk a little bit more about what's going on with the airlines. Cowan's Helene Becker joins us now. Elaine, um, thanks very much for your time on this Christmas Eve Eve. Uh, what, what is the general situation for the industry now? You know, we've reopened, we've passed, I guess, the pandemic. Uh, as far as I can tell, for months and months now, how has has the recovery been? It, it's it's been better than I think expected. Um, domestic leisure travel is is above 2019 levels. International is about 20 percent below, as is business traffic. So um, we're routinely screening between 2.1 on the lowish end and 2.4 or 5 million on the high end um, people a day that are traveling. And, and that's pretty much equal or very close to the 2019 average. So we've definitely seen an improvement. We've seen a shift in mix away from very um, deep discounts to people buying up into either premium economy or uh, the business class section for that extra comfort. And um, I think that that spend on, on uh, services this year, this quarter, and this holiday season have been very strong. So I know you've got basically buy ratings, outperform ratings on a number of these right. airlines. I'm looking through uh, Delta, for example, United, um, Southwest. What gives them an advantage over the others? Yes, I, I'm not sure United has an advantage today as the storms have moved across the country. So it goes from San Francisco, Denver, Chicago, and, and Newark, kind of in that order, and their hubs just get hit on a rolling basis. But that said, um, in general, Delta United and, and Southwest are, I think, the most, uh, some of the mo more interesting names. Um, Delta and Southwest just have very good balance sheets. Southwest has a fortress balance sheet. They came through the pandemic really well. They have net cash. They announced earlier this month that they're going to resume the dividend, and which we expected. We expected them to announce that. I didn't expect them to go back to the full 72 cents a share uh, annual dividend, um, which they did. So the stock will yield about 2%. 
Um, Delta, we don't expect them to reinstate the dividend before the first first half, I think, of 2024. Basically, they're paying down debt. They've got a deal they've got a, um, on the table with their pilots, so they want to get through that. Um, and then we expect that uh, first half of 24 okay. is when they'll resume their dividend. Helene, you have a, an outperform on FedEx and uh, just a market perform a neutral rating on UPS. They're going to be, yeah. I, I expect, equally uh, hit by this, this bad weather right before Christmas. Yes, yes, yes. And the, and the difference really is more to do with the UPS Teamsters contract coming due uh, July 31st and, and the prolonged negotiations we see for most of the year. Um, because both are really, again, great companies, good balance sheets. UPS commits to returning 50% um, of adjusted net income to shareholders in the form of dividends. So really high quality balance sheets for both companies. Um, FedEx is going through their continual cost reduction program, which I think for all the three decades I've covered the stock they've always had, they've always had in place. Um, but yes, this is this is just unfortunate. There's nothing you can do about the weather. I think everybody probably understands that. Um, and the packages will mm. they'll do their best, right? They'll do yep. their best to get them there and they'll deliver Christmas Day if they have to. All right, Helene, thanks so much for joining us. Helene Becker there sure. from Cowan. Uh, we wish you a uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays as well. Time now for the Trading Diary, what you need to be watching this week. The UMich Consumer Sentiment Survey coming out at the top of the hour. Then new home sales rounding out the week. Markets are closed, obviously, on Monday. That's Boxing Day, but we get it because Christmas comes on a Sunday. Wholesale inventories, or inventories if you're British, come out on Tuesday. Thanks, John. And finally, another round of jobless claims on Thursday to wrap up the data for the year. Taking a look at what's going on in the markets right now, just 25 minutes into the session, the S&P 500 down half a percent, the Nasdaq down 1%. No Santa Claus rally today. This was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.